I'm saying to you, it is so important for you to understand the hour we are in because the devil has no power over you. Many people don't have an experience of the love of God. They know about the love of God. They know. They have heard that the love of God is so deep. It's so high. It's so wide. Jesus stood up and cried out, Is there anyone among you thirsty? Let him come to me and drink. There is an invitation that is made for believers. Jesus is making an invitation right now. Genesis chapter 3 from verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden? Remember, the apostle Paul says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. Hallelujah. He says that we must stand, we must, we must stand against the deceits of the devil. The deceptions of the devil. The, the, the schemes of the devil. The plottings of the devil. He has not changed. The devil has not changed. What he did in the garden, he's still doing right now. Hallelujah. You must understand that. The situation in the garden has not changed. It's still the same. That is why we see the, 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 the snake, the serpent, um, who was possessed by the devil speaking to the woman. So he says, As God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the tree of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings and 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 they heard the sound of the lord the king james actually this is what i want to focus on the king james says that they heard the voice of the lord god walking this one says the sound it says and they heard the sound of the lord god walking in the garden in the cool of the day and adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the lord god among the trees of the garden then the, then the lord god called to adam and said to him where are you so he said i heard your voice listen to it he says i heard your voice in the garden and i was afraid because i was naked and i hid myself and he said who told you that you were naked have you eaten from the tree which i commanded you that you should not eat the man said the woman whom you gave to be with me she gave me of the tree and i ate and the Lord God said to the woman, What is it that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. Do you see that? The serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, I want you to see something here. Very, very important from this passage. I'm saying to you, it is so important for you to understand the hour we are in because the devil has no power over you. But he can deceive you if you let him. And many people let the devil deceive them when they step out of the presence of God. Hallelujah. When you take your eyes away from God and you focus on other things and those things become your primary focus, your priority, the devil is going to deceive you. Hallelujah. So he comes to the woman and he says to her, listen to what he says. He says to the woman, God knows that the day you eat this fruit, your eyes are going to be open. And then he says, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now let me ask you a question. Was Adam and Eve not already like God? Were they not like God? So the devil says that God knows that if you eat of this fruit, your eyes are going to be open. Today many people's eyes are not open. What men lost in the garden, first thing that the men lost was sight. Was sight. The devil says, God knows that the day you eat of this tree, your eyes will be open. The eyes of Adam was open. But he was not seeing himself. 
He was not seeing according to how man sees. He was seeing according to how God sees. So when the devil comes and he says, the day that you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be open. The devil was actually trying to get Adam's eyes to become blind of God because when you are blind of God, you are going to be, you are going to have sight on you and your surroundings. Hallelujah. When you can't see God, you see yourself and your limitations. The devil knew that. So he was there to deceive them. He was there to make them think, reason with him. And the moment you start to reason with the devil, I'm telling you, he's going to deceive you. In the flesh, you do not have a chance against the devil. Let me tell you something that you do not understand. When we read the Bible of John chapter 9, John chapter 9 starts with Jesus healing a man who was born blind. When you accelerate in, I think it's verse 19, Jesus says to the Pharisees, he says, for this reason I have come. He says, for this reason I have come. For this reason I have come. He's trying to explain to them why did he come. He says, for judgment, so that those who do not see may see. And that those who see may become blind. Look at what Jesus is saying. He says, I have come that those who do not see may see. Do you think he was talking about blind eyes like the man that he, that he opened the account? Opening his eyes? No. That is why the Pharisees then ask him a question. They says, are we blind also? And then Jesus said, if you were blind, you will have no sin. But because you say, you see. Your, your, your sin remains. Listen to what Jesus is saying. He says, I have come that those who do not see may see. Even when you look at um, Luke chapter 4, one of the things that Jesus Christ says he was anointed for, he says, the recovery of sight to the blind. The recovery of sight to the blind. For those who used to see, but now are blind for them to see. Hallelujah. Because Adam used to see. Adam used to see. But when the devil came and he ate of the fruit, he became blind to God and he became alive. He had sight to himself. And that is the picture of the law. The do's and don'ts. Because when you, when you do the law, I'm going to teach you a lot about, about grace and law in the new dispensation, in the new year. For you to understand these things very well so that the devil doesn't deceive you. That is why the apostle Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. And the first thing that he tells us is the belt of truth. What is the belt of truth? The belt of truth is Jesus. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. And then in John 8, 31, he says, If you continue in my word, you shall be my disciples indeed. And then he says, And you shall know the truth. What was he saying? You shall know me. And then he says, And the truth shall make you free. And I will make you free. Because whom the Son sets free, he is free indeed. Hallelujah. So the first thing that men lost in the garden was sight. Was not provision. Men lost sight before God came. Hallelujah. Because the moment they ate of the fruit, then they became self-conscious. They realized that they were naked. You cannot afford to be self-conscious at this hour. You cannot afford to look at your life at this hour. Look up. Look at God. Look at what he's doing. Hallelujah. If you focus on God, you focus on his word, you focus on what he's doing, you will not be ashamed of yourself. You will not be ashamed of the call that God has put in your life and you will not see any limitations. The first thing that men lost was sight was sight. And when Jesus came, he says, I've come to restore sight. Hallelujah. So that those who do not see may see. What must they see? The Bible says that we do not yet see all things put under him. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. It says, but we see Jesus. Hallelujah. We see Jesus. We see Jesus. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith. God wants your eyes to be open to see him. Hallelujah. To see him. To see things the way he sees them. You know the difference between a Christian who's struggling and a Christian who is doing well is their sight. That is why the Bible says that the lamp of the body or the light of the body is the eye. And it says but if your eye is single or if your eye is full of light. It says your whole body will be full of light. Your life is a sum total of what you see. So men lost sight. And when man lost sight, he became self-conscious. And God is making an invitation today. Hallelujah. 
God is making an invitation today. Let me accelerate. Let me go to another verse, another portion of scripture. We're going to talk a little bit about this and, and then we're going to close. I want to leave you with a message that is going to sustain you carrying into the new year. Hallelujah. Luke 14. Luke 14, verse 15 to 24. Luke 14. Note what men lost. Hallelujah. Man did not lose provision. Provision is a secondary thing. Provision is a secondary thing. And I can tell you why. Because let me tell you something. There are unbelievers with a lot of money. They don't struggle for bread. But they can't see God. Hallelujah. They can't see God. They can't see God. You and I, as, a, as believers, we are called to see God. That is why if you can't see God, your prosperity is going to be short-lived. If you can't see God, you will focus on circumstances. And when you focus on circumstances, you are going to be stressed. You are going to be anxious. You are going to lose your joy. Hallelujah. I'll tell you the next thing that men lost as we go into this. The second thing that men lost was fellowship. And that's the invitation that God is making today. And I'm going to show you how important fellowship is as we, as, we, as we read and how you can learn to fellowship with God because it's only when you fellowship with Him that you're going to have an experience of His love. Many people don't have an experience of the love of God. They know about the love of God. They know. They have heard that the love of God is so deep it's so high, it's so wide. They know that God is love and his love is unconditional, but they do not have an experience. You know, I was pondering on this uh, some few days ago. I was sitting with my, with my baby girl and she's, she's, she's upstairs. This girl, she loves God in an amazing way. We pray in my house every night as a family. We pray in the spirit. We worship God every night without faith. Around six or so, she will come and say, Mfunak Tandas. Daily, it's time to pray. Hallelujah. Now, this other day I'm sitting with her and I'm calling her. I'm saying, baby, come to daddy. She was sitting on another couch and I'm sitting. She goes like, I'm like, baby, please come to daddy. She says, no, I don't want. I don't want. Baby, come to daddy. You know why I'm calling her? I want to show her some love. I want to embrace her. I want her to feel the love of the father. Hallelujah. But she says, I don't want. And let me tell you, this girl, she gives me so much joy. So much joy. She's, she's, okay, let me not say this because there are people who are going to be jealous. So she comes and say, she comes and stands in front of me and she says, Daddy, pick up. Pick me up. All the time. And what is she doing? She's accepting the invitation of the father to show her love. Hallelujah. She will lift up her hands and I will pick her up. When she comes like that, she's not coming expecting anything. Hallelujah. She just wants the love of her father because she knows how she feels in the arms of her father. She has that experience. Why? We have fellowship with one another. I spend so much time with her. I run home to work, kiss Pastor Mom quickly and look for CD so in the house. Hallelujah. Now let me tell you something. Jesus said this. He said, let the children come to me. Let the children come to me. Because the kingdom is for such as this. They come to experience the love of the Father. God at this time, he wants to fellowship with us so that he can show us his love. He's making an invitation. That is why I've been telling you of late as we're praying and seeking God, you know, to say, change your prayer life. Change your prayer life. What makes so many people not experience results in their prayer life is because they are not interested in God. They are interested in what God can do. And that's not different to the children of Israel who were interested in God's acts. And each time he performed an act, after every act, they don't believe that he was going to perform again. Why? Because they did not have a relationship with him. All they wanted, they did not want to know his ways. They did not want to experience his heart. They just wanted to experience what he had. So many people when they pray, you know what they do? They present God a to-do list. A prayer. The prayer of many believers. Many of them even when you attend prayer meetings. It's a presentation of a to-do list. Come and give a to-do list. My baby girl when she comes and says, Daddy, pick up. That's all. Pick me up. And the next thing is love being experienced between one another. Hallelujah. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Because the Bible shows us that the wife and the husband, they are a picture of Jesus and the church. Can you imagine? Every time the wife comes to the husband, all she do is to present a to-do list. She does not allow the husband to show her love. 
Can you imagine? I'm just giving you a picture of what God is dealing with with us. We pray, yes, praying, we pray. But a prayer is limited to a to-do list. Let me show you another dimension why I'm saying Adam lost fellowship. So we saw here that the Bible says that he was coming in the cool of the day and Adam heard the voice of God. He heard his voice. The Lord came walking in the cool of the garden. Adam heard his voice. Hallelujah. Adam heard his voice. Now, why was God in the garden? Because in the garden there was everything. Now, imagine you have everything. The reason why you have challenges, so many challenges. The devil wants to keep you busy with a to-do list so you never experience God. You never experience his love. Every time you go to him, you have a to-do list. Adam never had a to-do list. Why? Adam had everything he wanted in the garden. So why, what, why, why was God in the garden? Why was God in the garden, believers? It was for fellowship. God wanted to extend his love. Let me tell you, many people are trying to love God and they fail desmally. Change your mindset. Have God love you. When God has loved you, you will be able to love back. Hallelujah. He says we love him because he first loved us. If he loves you and you take the same love he loved you with and love him back, you will be able to love your wife. You will be able to love your children. You will be able to love your cousins. You will be able to love your friends and everyone around you. But it starts with him. Hallelujah. Let's read. Let's read. We're talking about divine invitation. Hallelujah. He says, now, Luke 14, verse 15. It says, now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. I wish I had time to, to give you the background. Just go read from Luke 1 up to verse 13 to verse 14 and connect what, what, what they were talking about here. When that man, but it's so deep, when that man said, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. You see what this man is saying? This man had a revelation. He says, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. This man was talking about from the perspective of the context when you read here, it's like this man was talking about at the end of the, of the time when, 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 when everything is fulfilled and all those things. That is when we are going to eat bread. No. We eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, hallelujah. Because the works have been finished. That's why the Bible says that when Christ presented his own blood, he made a once and for all sacrifice that perfected us forever. And after he done that, he sat down. Why did he sit down? The works have been finished. And the fact that the works have been finished, it means we can eat bread now at the kingdom of God. Look at what it says here. It says, then Jesus gave a parable saying, a certain man gave a great supper. Look at that. What, was, what did the man give? A great supper. A great supper. The revelation of this portion about, I'm about to read is that part. What did he give? A great supper. A great supper. Supper represents the evening meal, which is the last meal. Hallelujah. It's a, it's, a, it's a picture of the end time. The time we're living in right now. Hallelujah. So it says a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. There is an invitation that is made. Hallelujah. The great supper. And he invited many. And sent his servants at supper time. To say to those who were invited. Come for all things are ready. Hallelujah. I've come to prophesy to your life today. To say in the kingdom of God. All things are made ready for you. Hallelujah. God prepared them. God knew that there was going to be a pandemic. God knew that we were going to go through this time. And he prepared things ahead of us. And he's making an invitation. He says come. God is making an invitation. That is why he says that come to me. All those who labor and are heavy laden. He says I will give you rest. In the midst of the toiling. In the midst of the labor. Come to me. I'm making an invitation. And I will give you rest. You know when you read John chapter 4. This, the, 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 the situation between Jesus and the woman at the well. Ne? Jesus says to the woman, woman, give me a drink in John chapter 4. The woman says that, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jesus said this statement. He says, if you knew who you were talking to, you will ask of him. He says, if you knew, you will not be focused on what you are trying to give me. You will know who I am and you will ask from me. 
God is looking at supplying. Hallelujah. He says, I'm here to supply to you. Woman, your water that you are, you are boasting about, it is perishable. He says, but the water that I shall give him shall be to him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. He says, those who drink of this water, they shall never thirst. Hallelujah. There is water that you only find in the presence of God. And at the hour like this, God says, come, all things are made ready for you. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who's talking to you, he would have asked him. And he says, he would have given you living water. Hallelujah. What we need right now is living water. John 7, 37, the Bible says, at the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, is there anyone among you thirsty? Let him come to me and drink. There is an invitation that is made for believers. Jesus is making an invitation right now. It says, the Bible says here that he made a great supper. Even, even, even at that feast, it was the last day of the feast. It was the last day of the feast. Denoting that we are living in the last days. He says at that great day of the feast, they call out and said, is there anyone among you thirsty? This is the question I'm asking today. What is it that you are going through today? The answer for the world is Jesus. Hallelujah. The answer for the believer is Jesus. A believer cannot look for alternatives at this time. A believer must keep his eyes on Jesus. Hallelujah. So he says, come, for all things are now ready. But look at this. Look at this. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. Now look at this. What is he inviting them to? He inviting them to a great supper. And if you look, read further, that great supper was in the house. It was not in a, in a, in a, in a venue somewhere. He says, in my house. In my house. It's a great supper. What happens at supper? Look at it. Who prepared the supper? He prepared the supper. He says, come. What do you come to do? You come to fellowship and feast in his presence. Hallelujah. Can you learn to feast in the presence of God? At this hour, we need to learn that. To learn to feast in the presence of God. That is why Martha and Mary, the Bible tells us that, you know, um, um, Martha was troubled about many things. Trying to serve in the kitchen. Trying to do all sorts of things. But Mary stayed at his feet. Hallelujah. And Jesus said, she has chosen that good part. Which no one will be taken away from her. She was sitting there fellowshipping with him. What God is looking for right now is fellowship. My brothers and my sisters. But many people don't know how to fellowship with the Lord. Their prayer life is a to-do list. Can you please change your mindset? Change your mindset. You're not born again. Maybe you're watching us. I just want to pray with you right now to receive Jesus. Everyone here who wants to receive Jesus, just make this prayer with, with us. Just say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying for me on the cross. Today, I give you my life. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your spirit to overflow. I thank you, Lord, that my name is written in the book of life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a round of applause. The Lord is good. You need to experience him. He needs to touch your heart. You cannot experience that out there. There are certain things I always tell you that God is going to minister to you only when you set yourself aside.